No promises you will continue to be able to hear me. We'll see how the drumming goes. Um, what's up with that? Uh, for those of you who are new this week, one, hopefully you found um, a bulletin. Hopefully you have a, a welcome card in it. We'd love to get to know you better. Two, if you're new this week, want you to know there is not typically a Hindu worship cultural festival uh, going on in the lobby of the place where we meet for church. Um, that's, that's unusual for us. Uh, we were asked about it. They, they'd kind of rented the space for the weekend, and can we continue to meet out here? It'll be low-key. There won't be, you know, anything disruptive, but sh- we said sure, and, and we'll see how the drums continue. Um, but here's the deal. When you think about the early church, they did not have buildings, uh, and they probably didn't even rent buildings. They just found public places to meet, maybe in a synagogue to start with, maybe alongside the river, maybe in the marketplace, and there were often the sounds of the surrounding people worshiping whatever God they worshiped in the midst of it, in the midst of their preaching, in the midst of their own worship. So I really hope that we'll, um, we'll see this as an opportunity um, to simply be who we are, to worship our God, and also love our neighbors, and um, to welcome people who, who clearly don't worship our God, um, to know who we are and who he is, and who knows what it might look like for them to join us in the future. So if you get a chance to love your neighbors out there, um, go ahead. If you get a chance to, you know, welcome people to share in some donuts or whatever, go ahead. That would be great. Um, welcome to week three in our series called We Are the Church, God's Chosen Instrument to Change the World. This will be the first of two weeks where we're asking the question, what kind of relationships, specifically what kind of relationships get, did God design us to have in his church? What kind of relationships did God make us for. Uh, So to begin, I just want to share a little bit of my experience with relationships in the church. I want to take you back to my my junior year of college, and uh, it was a very good year for me, one of the best years of my life, Uh, the year I I met my now bride, among other things. But uh, that particular afternoon was not a good afternoon for me. It was, it felt like a terrible afternoon, and I don't know what all the factors were that went into it. There's a lot going on in life. It's hard to sort it out. I know that at least part of my problem, part of what was perplexing and weighing me down was that my dad was dying of cancer. It had been five years. He had been battling, and that battle was nearing an end, and everybody knew it. Um, there was also that girl I mentioned, cute, cute redhead, just getting to know her. I had fallen head over heels, and um, I'd even expressed my interest, to which she was completely not interested. So she was not even talking to me. That, that felt like a beating. Uh, we also had this college ministry we had started, and it, it, was, it was awesome. One of, the, one of the most exciting things I've ever been a part of, to just see God move and work. We started the year with eight students. Um, by, by the middle of the winter, we had, we had between 60 and 100 students. We had seen... Um, we had seen over 30 people profess faith in Christ. And so when that was going well, I mean, I was on cloud nine. That was amazing. When that was going poorly, when people were falling away, um, when people were criticizing my leadership, I was absolutely devastated. I was 21. I did not know how to deal with that. I just, I just felt extremely lonely and discouraged. And that's where I was at that afternoon. So I walk into my dorm room, and my roommate, Aaron, he is, he is lounging on one of the sofas. We had these um, three super-sized brown sofas that kind of took up the whole room, and we had lofts above it. So he's, he's, just, he's just lounging there, you know, it's the afternoon doing his, his college thing. And so I walk in the room, and I slouch down next to him. And I stare at the ceiling, and tears start streaming down my face. And my, my roommate, Aaron, he was more sensitive than the average guy, you know, so still didn't know what to do with the situation, you know. But, but he, like, he, like, maybe puts his hand on my shoulder a little bit. And um, before he knew it, I had, like, rolled my head over and buried my head in my chest, and I'm crying. I haven't done that a lot in life. I don't think I've ever done that before. But I totally understand that, that some of you men, you, you've judged me. It's over. I'm a sissy. You, you, got, you got nothing. I, I, there's nothing else I can say. My man card's gone. You'll, I don't know, beat me up in the, in the lobby later. But here's the deal. I want, I want to ask you to hang with me for just a minute. Um, because there's a reality, whether we know it or not, 
that all of us have a deep desire to know and be known, to love and be loved, to have real and deep and genuine and meaningful relationships. And some of you, you're like, yeah, but, but I'm not needy. You know, I mean, my life's going great. I'm successful all as well. I, I'm still on my way to happily ever after. And, and your life may be going great now. You, you may not be able to imagine a scenario, guy or girl, where, where you're going to bury your head in somebody else's chest and weep. But I promise you that day is coming where your circumstances are going to change. Maybe, maybe cancer is going to come knocking at your door. Or maybe that romantic relationship that is such a source of hope and joy for you now is going to turn toward abuse. Or maybe, maybe that job that you've been angling toward and, and you're about to get and, and it's going to solve all of your problems, maybe the economy is going to change and that job is going to be gone and everything you've built your life around is going to evaporate. And in that moment, I promise you, you will be needy. You will need friendships. You, you will be looking for something you don't have. And, and that goes for men and women alike. Um, I, I know there's, there's this tough guy mentality, this, you know, this loner, independent, I need no one, I'm not a crier. Um, yeah, maybe you're not today, you will be. I have had the privilege to serve alongside and disciple a lot of manly men. Uh, D1 linebackers, uh, drug addicts, um, multiple felons, uh, gangbangers, the, the cops, the federal agents who arrest them, Marines, the whole nine yards, okay? And, and what I've seen is that while these men want to represent themselves as different, they're tough, they're strong, they're, they're manly. Again, I, I'm not a crier. That was one of my best friends in the world, Joe Ostrand. Several years of our relationship, he just wanted to remind me, dude, dude, I'm, I'm not a crier, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't need that, I don't need that stuff, I'm not like that. Until the day came that he was a crier. That day will come when, when you will figure out that you are needy. And you'll figure out what kind of friends you have and what kind of friends that you wish you had. Uh, some of you, you guys are on the absolute opposite end of the spectrum. You need no convincing. You know that you're broken. You know that you're needy. You know that you're lonely. And you feel miserable and ashamed about all of it. And I just want to welcome you, and I want to comfort you with the reality that you're not weird because you're lonely or needy. There's nothing dysfunctional about you. You are normal. I love what Tim Keller said about this. He said, to need and to want deep friendships is not a sign of spiritual immaturity, but maturity. It's not a sign of weakness, but of help. Because God created Adam in his own image. He created Adam and Eve to be relational. And before sin entered the world, God said it is not good to be alone. So Keller continues, Adam was not lonely because he was imperfect, but because he was perfect. If you feel lonely, you are not dysfunctional, you are fine. You are lonely because you are not a tree. You were made this way. So whether we can see it now or not, by God's design, we all desire to know and be known. We all desire to love and be loved. We all long for deep, meaningful, dependable relationships. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about community. We're asking the question, what kind of relationships? What kind of relationships did God make all of us for? And to answer that question, we're going to look at one of the great relational stories in the Bible. We're going to look at the, the friendship between David and Jonathan. We'll camp out mostly in the first four verses of 1 Samuel 18, and we'll jump around a little bit in some of the other passages in 1 Samuel that help us to see how this unfolds. But we're going to ask two questions. What do real relationships look like? Not what we settle for, not this Facebook thing, not, not the facades and the games that we play, but what do real relationships look like, and where do we find them? First, I want to set the context a little bit. Um, some of you, if you grew up in the church, you probably know the basics of the story. Uh, some of you probably don't. Here's the gist. We got this guy, Jonathan, and he is the prince of Israel. Um, Israel, God's chosen people of the Old Testament 3,000 years ago. Um, God has appointed their very first king. His name is Saul, and Jonathan is his son. 
We also have this guy named David, and David, he's a teenager. He is obscure. He is unknown. He's poor. He's got nothing. So we've got, we've got royalty over here, and we've got, we've got the youngest of eight sons of a shepherd boy, the, the, the guy who is on you know, sheep dropping duty. That's, that's what he did for his life. But all of a sudden, as our story begins to unfold, this character David, he jumps from complete obscurity to national fame because he just went toe-to-toe with this giant named Goliath. If you don't know a lot of other Bible stories, maybe you've heard of David and Goliath. There's this thing, this, this little boy, he takes, well, we'll get into the story more, but, but basically he takes a slingshot and he throws a stone at this giant's head. It hits him, hits him between the eyes, the giant drops. David comes he, uh, he cuts off the giant's head, and again, he's a little bit famous. So as our story picks up, David and Jonathan, they're meeting for the first time, and David has just come from the battlefield with Goliath, and he is still literally carrying the giant's head in his hand like a, he's carrying it like a game-winning football. That is the scene. That is what's going on. Um, if you have a Bible, pick up with me. 1 Samuel 17, verse 57. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before King Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. I told you, that's really what was happening. I wasn't just making that up for fun, although the 14-year-old boys love that. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing, and he gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Picking up with with verse 1, I want us to start to see what real relationships look like. Verse 1, after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as he loved himself. And we're going to come back to this verse a little bit later, but for now I just want you to get one big idea out of it. I want you to see that Jonathan's relationship with David was characterized by selfless love. I want you to see that real relationships are selfless. And this is something that is very easy to say, and it is very difficult to live. It's it's very difficult to make this tangible and to live it out on a daily basis. But as the story unfolds, we see that, that Jonathan's father, King Saul, he had become intensely jealous of David because Saul knew that there were these prophecies that God had declared that David was going to be the next king. Saul, Saul had displeased God, and David was going to be his replacement, and Saul knew it. So there was this, this jealousy going on. And so Saul, he, he becomes this very obsessive, murderous person. And the one thing that he wanted in life more than anything else was that he could take his spear and that he could thrust it straight through the heart of David. That was what kept him awake at night, just dreaming about the day that he would have that opportunity. I want you to see how Jonathan responds to that. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and he said, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, which is probably where we get the expression from. Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send and bring him to me, for he must die. Jonathan fires back, why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at Jonathan to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. And what we see in the story is that Saul is right. Saul assessed the the situation correctly, and Jonathan knew that his dad was right. Jonathan's the prince. Jonathan is the heir to the throne according to how, you know, those things were done back in the day. But God has declared, no, I'm going to replace Saul with David. Jonathan completely understood that David was in his way of becoming the next king of Israel. 
he assessed that rightly. From a selfish point of view, the best thing that Jonathan could have done in that moment would be to say, yeah, yeah, bring him in here. Slaughter him before my eyes and I will be the next king. But Jonathan was not in this relationship for himself. This was not a selfless relationship on Jonathan's part. As friends, we really struggle to serve each other. Every one of us struggle with it. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship it is. In marriage, I, I really struggle to serve my wife. Um, in marriage, I, I struggle slightly and I consistently fail to let my wife have the last cookie. It's not even really a struggle. It's just this selfish thing that I do because, you know, she made the cookies and I already ate most of them, but there's one cookie left and I really want it, so I just go. Because I am naturally selfish and you are naturally selfish. I'm, I don't know how you, your selfishness plays out. Maybe you don't even like cookies, but you're selfish. We're all like this. It is hard to be selfless, but that is what God is inviting us into. Jonathan loved David selflessly, so much so that he was willing to give up his entire kingdom for David's good. So much so that Jonathan was willing to repeatedly risk his own life for his friend because real relationships, the kind of relationships that God is inviting us into are selfless. Second thing we see in this passage is that real relationships are committed. I want to look back at kind of the primary text, picking up in verse 3. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. So from day one, Jonathan saw this relationship as something that was permanent. And so Jonathan made a permanent covenant with David. From this day forward, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. We associate that covenant with marriage because marriage is, frankly, the only covenant relationship that we have in our society, and we don't even take that covenant very seriously anymore. Many don't. Okay, but this wasn't a marriage. This was a friendship. And Jonathan, from, from the moment he met David, he made a covenant with him, and he said, I'm with you. I, I'm sticking with you. Not, it's not just about me anymore. I'm not looking out for my selfish interests. I'm looking out for you. I'm with you. I will share with you. I'll defer to you. I... I will lay down my life for you. Again, that's not how we operate. And there's lots of ways that we can justify that and say, well, well clearly we can't operate that way. I mean, we have, we have a transient society. We move across the country. My job's over here. I got to go. And that's fine. I'm not like criticizing you if you move across the country. I met some people this morning who recently moved here. You know, it's not like shame on your first day of church. But here's the question that I want to raise. Who do you have in your life who is not family, who is committed to you? Who in your life besides family is committed to you? Because I understand that we all have like a circle of friends, you know, most of us are on Facebook, most of us, you know, have an iPhone or some cheap imitation of an iPhone that's not nearly as good. Um, and, you know, in, in your iPhone or iPhone substitute, um, you've, you've probably got 50, 100, 300 contacts. Some of you, maybe you're in sales or something. Maybe you have 1,000 contacts. Maybe you have, you know, 1,000 or more friends on Facebook, but that's really not what I'm talking about here. I'm saying outside of family, who do you have in your life that's committed to you? Because there's, there's smaller circles than your Facebook friends, right? You know, who are the 30 or 10 or even five people that you really spend time with? And who among them who among them can you call at four in the morning? Let's say you finally run into one of those seasons where life really isn't going well anymore. And, and nobody's bleeding, there's, there's, there's no blood, there's no guts, there's no need for a trip to the emergency room, but you are at your end. And it's 4 a.m. Who can you call in that moment and know that you won't be a bother? That they will pick up the phone and they will be glad to hear from you. They won't be mad at you. They won't shame you. They, they won't be disgusted with you. They won't grunt and groan and say, what is wrong with you that you're calling me at 4 a.m.? Do you have those people in your life? Because I promise you that David did. You, you look at how this story unfolds and we just see it over and over. I'll just give you a few examples of it. 
we got this scene where there, there's repeated scenes in 1 Samuel where Saul is trying to hunt down David like a dog. And we get to one of those scenes and, and David is worn out and he is deeply discouraged. And Jonathan comes to David and, and according to the scripture, chapter 23, verse 16, it says, he helped David find strength in God. Basically, Jonathan, he put his hand on David's shoulder and he said, quote, don't be afraid. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Who is in your corner to help you find strength in God when you don't even have the strength in yourself to turn to God? Who is there for you? Tom Basil, Joe Ostrand, Aaron Kerr, and half a dozen among the people who are here right now. I honestly know that I could call at 4 a.m. and it would not be a problem. Now, I don't know whether they'd have their ringer on. I don't know if they'd have their, you know, smartwatch on that would, like, vibrate and tell them that I'm texting. But if I need them, I can call at any hour and they are eager, eager to be there for me. Who do you have like that in your life? Real relationships, what do they look like? Real relationships are selfless, and by God's design, they're committed. One more thing I want us to see in this passage. Real relationships are vulnerable. Uh, jump back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 4. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing, and he gave it to David, along with his tunic, and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. And probably the best word to describe this gesture would be humility. It's a gesture that really doesn't make much sense in our culture, but by dressing David in his own clothes, what Jonathan was doing was he was elevating David as his peer. Because Jonathan, he's the prince. He's the heir to the throne. He, he is the guy with all the status, and David is the shepherd boy cleaning up sheep poop, okay? But Jonathan, he elevates him. He says, you are my peer. I'm going to share my royal status with you. I will clothe you in my royal garments. You will carry my sword. You will carry my bow. You will carry my spear. You will be elevated to my place. And this is a gesture that foreshadows a small fraction of what we have in Jesus. That, that Jesus is God who became a man who laid down his life, who died on a cross, who rose from the dead so that we could be united by him, we could be united to him by grace through faith. And when he did that, what he does is that Jesus shares his identity with us. Jesus clothes us in his own righteousness. We get to share in his status. So this is a foreshadowing of that. There's humility, there's a sharing of identity, there's a foretaste of the gospel. But this morning we're talking about relationships, so I want you to see the vulnerability in this. Um, anybody remember junior high? Anybody? You, you guys you just completely blocked it out. Like 90% of the room has completely blocked it out. It's like it doesn't exist. So you got this thing called the junior high locker room. You know, you're, you're at the most insecure age of your entire life, bar none. And you're supposed to go in this locker room and change your clothes, you know, depending on your school. They might even expect you to take a shower in this big room. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's like abuse. It's not good. Okay? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Most of us did not like the junior high locker room because we felt vulnerable. Because when you take your clothes off, you feel vulnerable. Okay? And that's what Jonathan did before David. He made himself vulnerable. He took off his clothes. He took off his armor. And, and in, in my visualizing of it, he's still wearing boxers, and that's all great. But, but he's humbling himself, okay? He's making himself vulnerable. He's sharing his identity. He's taking off his weapons. He's handing his weapons to the guy who God has prophesied is, is going to reign on the throne instead of you. Real relationships are vulnerable. And as we look at this relationship between David and Jonathan, we again and again see mutual vulnerability. That they're, they're placing their lives in each other's hands. Um, they're, they're vulnerable physically. They're, they're vulnerable emotionally. 
Uh, we, we see these guys repeatedly caring for each other, comforting each other. We, we, we see these guys weeping with each other. We see these guys kissing each other, which again, it's a cultural thing. It's not something that fits. I'm not saying that all of our men's groups, we're going to start meeting in boxers and crying and kissing. And that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that there is a picture of vulnerability that we could use to learn something from. Because that isn't how we tend to do life. We tend to put on a mask. We tend to put on a facade. We tend to pretend that we've got it all together. You know, when you walk into church on Sunday morning or when you walk into a a small group within our church, there is a tendency among all of us to put on a mask. You know, if you've had a horrible day, if you're deeply discouraged, if, if if you're just struggling... And somebody asks you, hey, how's it going? (laughs) Doing great. Doing great. Great. It's really great. Where are the cookies? Let me put something in front of my face so that you can't really see the expression on my face because I don't want to be real with you. And I want you to understand that is not productive. That is not helpful. That's not a real relationship. That's really not a lot better than Facebook. It's just going through the motions and pretending that we have something that we do not have God invites us to be vulnerable. He invites us into relationships. um, For for guys, he invites us into relationships that are about more than the score of the football game, okay? I don't know what ladies talk about. I I really don't. They don't let me in, even though I have a girl's name. (laughs) But we need to get to the place where we can talk about our hopes and our fears and our dreams and our failures. We need to get to the place where we can talk about the things that we believe in our hearts that we can't talk about. Because all of us, we have these things that we're ashamed of, that we're insecure about, that we just say in our heart, oh, if, if they knew this about me, then they would not want to be my friends. And that may be true. If your friends knew the real you, they may not want to be your friends anymore. But all that means is that you have lousy friends, and it's time to just face the brutal facts and start over and find some real relationships. Because God is inviting you into something that is better than that. In the story of David and Jonathan, we don't see every aspect of the sort of relationships that God is inviting us into, but we see, we see some good stuff. We see selflessness, we see commitment, we see vulnerability. And, and if we're being honest, who wouldn't want that, right? So how do we find relationships like that? How do we find real relationships? Um, as we turn back to this story of David and Jonathan, what we'll see is that beautiful biblical relationships are a byproduct. Beautiful biblical relationships are a byproduct. They are the unexpected overflow of what is already going on in our lives. And we jumped into the story starting with the day that David and Jonathan met. But their story doesn't start there. And and the Bible gives us the backstory, and the backstory is beautiful in that it helps us to understand why they clicked when they finally came together. It gives us some context, so I want to take a couple of minutes to look at that. The first mention of Jonathan, the first time that we see him in Scripture, Jonathan, he is leading this, this two-man attack to take back a, an Israelite outpost that has fallen to the enemy. Okay, so there's this outpost, there's like 20 guys, they're up on a ridge, and and they own this land, this strategic outpost that used to be Israelite land. And we see that Jonathan, it's just him and his armor bearer, and an armor bearer, it's like the 12-year-old boy who carries his shield, okay? Um, It's not necessarily an impressive warrior, although, you know, if you're 12 and whatever. He turns to his armor bearer and he says, come. Let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows, meaning the people who didn't worship the God of Israel. He says, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. So he's like, hey, there's 20 of them, there's two of us, kind of one and a half of us, but, but perhaps God will deliver them into our hands. I mean, he can do whatever he wants, right? So let's give it a go. And a few verses later, Jonathan, he's literally climbed down one cliff, He's crossed the ravine. He's climbed up the other, other cliff. He and his armor bearer, they've taken out these 20 soldiers. They've, they've recaptured the hill. What do we learn from that? Well, obviously, Jonathan is, is very brave. He's a great warrior, but that's not what Jonathan is about. 
what we see is that Jonathan knew that when he went into battle, he fought for more than personal victory. Jonathan knew that he fought for the glory of God among the nations. Jonathan fought to change the world. That was, that's the, the subtitle in the series. We are the church, God's chosen instrument to change the world. Jonathan understood that he was a part of this campaign to bring the glory of God to the ends of the earth. And so that meant that he could rush headlong into battle on a perhaps. Because the critical issue was not whether he won or lost. The critical issue was not whether he lived or died. The critical issue was whether he stewarded his life to the glory of God with every opportunity that he had. That is what he cared about. That's how he made decisions. Do I see an opportunity to give God glory with my life even if it costs me my life? Oh, that is what I want. That is what I'm chasing after no matter the cost. Fast forward to the first good look we get at David. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. David arrives at the battle not as a soldier, but as an errand boy. Okay? Smallest, youngest son out of eight, shepherd boy. He, he's, bringing, he's bringing goods. He's bringing supplies to his older brothers who are in, in the army, and, and he's there to, to get a report, to get news to bring back to daddy. That was his role in the battle. And as he arrives, this, this giant Goliath, this guy who's like nine feet tall or whatever, he is calling out the Israelites, and he's challenging them to find a man who has the courage to go toe-to-toe with him. And no one is answering the call until David shows up, and here's what he says. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? We see something looks a lot like Jonathan. So we get this teenage boy, David, and he squares up. He goes toe-to-toe with the fiercest warrior in the Philistine army. And, And as they're squaring up for battle, David warns Goliath. He says, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Just like Jonathan, David's obsession in life was that God might be glorified. So what happens when Jonathan met David? Back where we began in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. What happens when these two men meet? After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. And he loved him as himself. It literally says, Jonathan's soul was bound to the soul of David. The verb is passive, meaning this is not something that Jonathan was trying to do. This is something that spontaneously happened to him. Jonathan was not looking for a new best friend. You know, he wasn't, he, he wasn't like combing Facebook, seeing who would want to hang out with him that evening. The verb is passive. He was not seeking this. It just happened. Because beautiful biblical relationships are a byproduct, and specifically, they're a byproduct of a shared passion for Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, he talks about this idea in his book called The Four Loves. He writes, that is why people who simply want friends can never make any. You've seen this dynamic? That is why people who simply want friends can never make any. The very condition of having friends is that we should want something else besides friends. Where the truthful answer to the question, do you see the same truth, would be, I see nothing and and I don't care about the truth. I only want a friend. No friendship can arise, though affection, of course, may. There would be nothing for the friendship to be about. And friendship must be about something, even if it were only enthusiasm for dominoes or white mice. Those who have nothing can share nothing. Those who are going nowhere can have no fellow travelers. 
He's saying that any friendship, any real relationship is a byproduct, a natural overflow of something that we share in common. So if you've been here for more than a week, you know that I'm a Cubs fan, right? Everybody knows? Some of you hate it when I mention that, but I am. Um, so when I meet another Cubs fan, there's an instant bond. You know, if, if they're simply wearing the hat or the t-shirt or whatever, we connect. You know, and we start talking. We start, you, you see the game last night? Two blown saves? 38, 38 games in a row without a blown save? Two blown saves? Can, can you... Uh, we've won nine out of the last 11, you know, we're going to the postseason, we'll probably repeat, we got this, you know, and, and we just keep on going on. You know, we, we do that, so that's literally what you do. Follow me around, go to U of M, we'll find a guy with a Cubs hat, this is what we'll do. Okay, so there's, there's certain relationships that form around those affinities. And I have relationships that form around, hey, we both got a 13-year-old on the soccer team, you know, so hey, we're, we're cheering for the East Arbor Rams, and you know, there's stuff like that. But here's, here's the rub. When the chips are down, um, when I lose my job, when my marriage is falling apart, when, when I am in desperate need of a friend, I promise you, I am not turning to my mutual Cubs fan relationships. Because the thing that we have built that friendship around, frankly, is not that substantial. It's not that important. When the chips are down and I need a friend, what I want what I want is a friendship that is built around our shared passion for Jesus Christ. What I want is a friendship that's, that's built around our shared indwelling by the Holy Spirit, that, that this God is in both of us, and he is continually reshaping us and recreating us in his image and remaking us into the sort of people who can love selflessly and who can love in a way that's committed and who can be vulnerable and who can be humble and, and who can really actually be the sort of friends that we need, amen? That's what we're going for. That's what our hope is. Where do we find those sort of friends? We don't find them at the sports bar, you know? We, we don't, we're not likely to find them, you know, at the, at the break station at the office or, or in our classrooms or whatever. We, we find them among God's people. We find them in the church and we invite other people into this that they might be reshaped by the gospel, that they might be recreated through faith in Jesus Christ and that, that God might, might make them into the sort of people who, who would join us in all of this, who would want to love each other selflessly, who would want to take on the identity of servant, who would love in a committed way. And while we wait for them to become great friends for us, we put all of our effort and all of our priority in simply being great friends to them. Because our needs have been met by our God. And by our God through God's people. And so that we become the people who are secure enough that, that when someone is needy, when someone collapses, when somebody rolls over and is literally crying on our shoulder, literally getting our shirt wet with our tears, we don't freak out. We don't embarrass them. We don't make fun of them. We love them. We are tender with them because God is working in us. Some of you might say, hey, Kay, I'm new here. I don't even know what I want to do with Jesus. You're talking about all this touchy-feely stuff. I haven't even decided if I, want, if I believe in Jesus, much less if I want to pursue him. What do you have for me? Here's the reality. Many of us are looking for community more than we're looking for Jesus. Whether you've been here for a long time or you've, you know, just shown up for the first time, many of us are looking for community more that, so than we're looking for Jesus. And we're looking for that because we have a legitimate need. Again, what Keller said, you're lonely because you're not a tree. You were made this way. This is normal. But I want us to see that we have a deeper need. Because even if you dive into community at Mosaic, I promise you, you will be disappointed. You know, I, I don't know how many people have tried so far, you know, we're, I don't know, 500, who, who, who knows? Um, so far, we're batting 1,000 for disappointment, okay? You, you dive into relationships here, even if you serve, even if you give, even if you, you volunteer and you like, oh, preacher said I, I ought to do this, I, I'm on it, I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna be the model student, whatever we will still let you down. Because that's just how people are. We're not trying to let you down, but, but we're broken. We're sinful. We're like you. 
And what your heart is longing for is a relationship with somebody who is better than you, who is more stable than you, who is more loving than you, who is more sacrificial than you, who is more, much, much, much more constant than you. The only place that you're going to find that is in the triune God. The, the longing that you have for stability and securing in your relationships can only be met by him. So as much as you want community, as much as you need community, we want to point you to him. To this same God who, whom you continue to rebel against and who I continue to rebel against. And yet even in the midst of our rebellion, he seeks us. He woos us. He pursues us. He sends his son to die in our place. To rise from the grave that we might have life in him. What made Jonathan and David's relationship work is that they took their eyes off of each other so that they could both look to God. They took their eyes off of each other so they could both look to God. If you want these relationships to work out in your life, they, they don't naturally work because you force it, because you seek it, because you long for it, because you make it an idol, because you say, oh, if I just had friends, this would work. These beautiful biblical relationships, they are a byproduct. They happen as you look to Jesus Christ, as you passionately pursue him, as you run after him, and, and you look off to the side and you see other people doing the same, and again, you find that you have something in common with them that is so much deeper than, than the fact that you're both excited that the Wolverines won. And you find the deepest relationships of your life, the most satisfying, the most soul-filling relationships. Some of you, you're probably thinking, okay, but this is still hard. I mean, I've tried to pursue Jesus. I've tried to run hard after him. Um, that's hard. What can you do for me? Can you throw me a bone? And the answer is yes, we can throw you a bone. Um, we recognize that it, it, takes, it takes time to develop your passion for God. It takes time to grow in relationship with him. It, it takes time for him to, to work some things out in your life that you'd even have that desire. So we offer community. Um, that's, that's why there's a men's retreat coming up this weekend. Come, give it a go. Get to know some guys. That's why there's a women's retreat next month. That's why we have these groups that meet in homes and they often share a meal so we can gather and we can form relationships and we can explore this stuff and, and give you the chance to figure it out. Because we believe that these relationships are ultimately a byproduct of a pursuit of Christ. And so we want to gradually, easily invite you alongside to pursue God with us. And we want to invite you into opportunities that are more than affinity-based relationships. What happens out in the world is that, you know, the, the stay-at-home moms of two, you know, that, that's where they find community with each other. And the, you know, the white college sophomores with a GPA of 3.6, you know, they, they congregate with each other. But we want to invite you into unexpected relationships. We want to invite you into intergenerational and diverse relationships. We want, to, we want to invite you into relationships that would never happen unless God moved. Um, looking at Joe, he's sitting in the back. He's one of our elders. Uh, when I met him, um, I don't know, he's like eight or nine years younger than me. Um, he was probably making two or three times what I make. His house was in a nice neighborhood, you know, single guy, nicer house than I had for a family of four, whatever. Um, he was a Spartans fan. Um, we had nothing in common. <laughs> nothing. He's one of my closest friends, Ryan over here. Um, he's an artist. He's a tech guy. He's a Cardinals fan. Nothing in common. You know? <laughs> one of my dearest friends in the world. Best man in my wedding, Aaron Kerr. Mentioned him earlier. The day I met him, um, I, was, I was wrapping up my freshman year of college. He was graduating high school. He was doing a, a college tour to the school that I went to, which was not the best school that he was looking at. In the programs he was pursuing, it was not the best school in either of them. I met him. First few minutes of getting to know him, I told him, hey, here's the deal. Yeah, you might have better academic opportunity over here, over there. You come here, you, you can join me in, in seeking to build a college ministry that's going to reach this campus for Christ. That's what I got. He decided to do that, and, and by God's grace, God moved, and, and, and we saw him do that. And, not, and he became my best friend, not because I was looking for a friend, not because he was looking for a friend, but he was best man in my wedding. I was best man in his wedding. 
Joe Ostrand, the, the, the not a crier I was telling you about, 6'3", uh, 250, manly man. His dad, like 60 years old, could still bench press 400 pounds. Um, his, his family, they were, they were three generations West Point. And just to tick off his dad, he enlisted in the Marines. Okay, that's, that's just the kind of guy he was. Again, he would remind me all the time, not a crier, okay? And, I re- and he proved it out. I remember hanging out at his house. It's 1 a.m. I, I arrived 11.30 midnight and I knocked on his door because he was, he was really in the midst of jacking up his marriage. He was pulling away from community. He was, he was going it alone. He was, he was being that guy. So I show up. I stand on his porch. Eventually, he's embarrassed enough that he lets me in. He, he turns on the football game, the tape of Monday Night Football he's still catching up on, and, uh, and he ignores me for like an hour, okay? He can do the stoic thing. He's not a crier. He doesn't need anybody, okay? Yeah, great. Finally, we start having a conversation after one in the morning, but, but he's still not letting down his guard because he's a tough guy, right? He doesn't need anybody. Until the day I finally saw him cry. Years later, a couple of weeks before we launched this church, we were in a prayer meeting, my wife, his wife, that he was reconciled to, who trusted Christ. Me, my wife, a few other people, we're, we're, we're gathered in a circle, and we are praying for you. We're praying for the people who would become Mosaic Church, for the people who would come to Christ through Mosaic Church, for the people who would be sent out from this church. And my 6'3", 250-pound Marine started crying. Why? Because when you've built your life around Jesus Christ, around his church, around the advancement of his kingdom, those are the moments when you cry. (laughs) I had nothing in common with that guy. But God gave us a deep, satisfying friendship because we were pursuing Christ together. And that's what I want for you. You will not find anything better in the world. You want relationships? Come and join us. We welcome you in. Get to know our God. Let him transform you and let him transform us together as a community. Amen? Let's pray. God, you are always gracious to us. You are always good to us. You are always um, patient in the midst of our stubbornness and foolishness. Lord, as all of us long for relationships, whether we can admit it or not, whether we know it or not, Lord, I pray that you would give us hope that you might personally satisfy the longings of our hearts and that you might prepare us to be the means through which you bring satisfaction and joy to the hearts of others. Um, Lord, may we see this as a beautiful hope and may it draw our hearts to worship even now. Amen.